This episode of Distraction is sponsored by Landmark College, offering comprehensive support for students with learning disabilities, ADHD, and ASD. Learn more at lcdistraction.org. Landmark College, we teach differently. My unified theory of everything is that life is about when people pay attention to something, they really want to get something back. Hello, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell, and welcome to Distraction. Today we have an extremely interesting man as our guest, uh, Jeff Lewis, an entrepreneur. He's the founder of the American Flag Football League, which is now on the NFL Network. Uh, obviously has a bright future to it because uh, you don't get concussions in flag football and you, you don't uh, develop encephalopathy. But that's, that's not the heart of Jeff's story. So, Jeff, could you tell me how you came to learn about ADD and what life was like before and how all this impacted you? Sure. I went to see a psychiatrist probably something like four or five years ago, and I'm 55. And it was more about that I was a little bit sort of blue, a little down in the dumps. And I was investigating the possibility of maybe getting some, you know, antidepressants. And he was talking to me for about two minutes, and he hands me a piece of paper. He goes, answer all these questions. And luckily, because of my ADHD, there weren't that many of them. <laughs> and I answered all the questions, and he looks at me and he goes, did anybody ever tell you that you have a totally different problem from what you came here for? And I said, well, what do you mean? And then he said, well, you're a classic. And... Then he gave me some stuff to read. And what was really interesting, that uh, one of the articles that I read was about the impact on people as parents when their uh, ADD is unmedicated and how they basically become, I mean, you know this better than I do, but how basically it, it might make one a little bit more short-tempered. Um, and when you think about that sort of consequence as, as the uh, object of that uh, short-temperedness, when you really didn't do anything to deserve it as a child, you know, it seemed that one of the things that was very clear was that it might actually, uh, if I tried the medication, it might actually have this sort of unintended consequences of actually improving my mood for the people who were around me. And so I went on uh, medication and lo and behold, um, I had some very interesting kind of results. I was, I had never been on the medication. I clearly had had this, uh, you know, um, you know, I'd clearly been dealing with this issue for a very long time. And it just sort of happened that through most of my life, I've been fortunate to put myself into positions where it actually wasn't the negative and it might have even been a positive. I mean, I was a um, I was a bond trader on a trading floor, which is a very, um, you know, sort of rat a tat tat, very quick response, responding to uh, external stimuli, a lot of um, you know, different people, some in person, some on the phone, walking around, uh, moving around. Uh, you know, it was kind of an ideal job. Yes. Um, and that was the job that I had for, you know, about 20, 25 years after college. So um, even though I had not dealt with uh, my attention issue, uh, I had sort of dealt with it, I guess, indirectly probably by finding a job for which it was, uh, if anything, a, not a negative and maybe even a positive. Oh, definitely. So the job kind of provided the treatment for you. Mm -hmm. So once you got your ADD diagnosed and, and treated, what what changed? Um, you know, I went from, uh, you know, it was all incredibly subtle. That's uh, the first thing that I kind of wasn't really prepared to appreciate. Um, you know, I probably like a lot of people when I, when reading the articles about the over, um, uh, prescribing of Adderall and these other things, you know, about how basically, um, you know, we were drugging all these kids into a sort of a comatose state or something. I didn't really understand. And what I discovered, at least for me, it was something quite remarkably different that essentially it was like, I don't know, I, I guess my sort of attention span went from a two to a four, but in a sort of perceptible way out of 10. Um, it's not, it's still not like I can, uh, uh, you know, sit around and write doctoral dissertations all day, but, you know, a meaningful improvement, but even more so, uh, I noticed that, you know, slight change in mood, 
that uh, I'm just I was just a little bit easier to deal with, a little bit less short tempered, a little bit less uh, impatient. Um, you know, at least in the in the bulk of the day when the medication's really kind of uh, you know in the system, and that was really fascinating. And uh, I found that it enabled me to engage in maybe other kinds of work a little bit more effectively, the kinds of things that require a little bit more investment of time and a little bit more, you know, being still and sort of really producing something instead of just this kind of like, you know, back and forth, very rapid response kind of work. Mm -hmm. And, and how did it impact your relationship with your wife and your son? I think that they were, uh, very happy about uh, having a slightly improved version of me uh, with which to deal. Um, like I said, I, I could see it sometimes, you know, maybe very late in the day or something, and I'll sort of, at least now I have an awareness of it, and I'll catch myself in that uh, short-temperedness that I might have had previously. So I'm sure it's much more pleasant for all of them. What would you say, you know, on the positive side of, of your ADD, what, what are the qualities that you have? Well, I, I don't want to take too much pride in it. Um, but I would say, you know, it seems to me and I know and I, now I obviously am much more sort of able to sort of detect it in people that I know and sort of see how it affects so many people. Um, and the interesting thing that I guess that a lot of us who have it seem to share is um, a creativity. Um, you know, the ability, you know, a conversation with, with me and a conversation between me and somebody else who has it, you know, will cover a remarkable array of ideas, topics, directions in a relatively short period of time, which is incredibly fertile for, for coming up with new things. Uh, you know, but again, the, the, I would say, if anything, the one of the things that was frustrating for me in the past was an inability to kind of get tasks completed. You know, it's frustrating to sort of have a few things on the to-do list at the beginning of the day and have them still be there at the end of the day. So while it's great to be creative, if you can't finish anything, the creativity sort of gets squandered. So one either has to find a way to improve uh, some of those other capabilities or at least maybe find somebody else to do that stuff for you. And I certainly see that. I see that a lot of some of the really, really, really sort of hyper successful people I know that clearly have it. One of the ways they manage is by basically having people sort of trailing behind them, sort of picking up all the stuff that needs to be done, and they just, you know, they just shoot out the uh, the ideas. Right, right. Well, so how did this idea of the American Flag Football League come about? Uh, it's pretty simple. I was at uh, five years ago a third grade game. Our son uh, was playing. And most third grade sports are difficult to watch as a spectator. <laughs> we have the love of a parent and you're out there, but uh, they, they don't really look much like sports. The kids don't really know what they're doing. And somehow flag football, even from first and second grade, was different. It was like more fun for them to play than most other sports and clearly look more like you're watching something entertaining than any other sports uh, played by kids. Just for listeners who don't know, what is flag football? Uh, so flag football is simply uh, football where instead of knocking the person off his feet to end the play, you pull a piece of fabric or what they call a flag off of his hip, and that ends the play. Pulling a flag is actually a bit more, requires a bit more exacting athleticism, frankly, than tackling somebody, and quite a bit more than actually playing, you know, touch, one-hand touch or two-hand touch. So it's an adaptation of football that's been around a very long time and is actually larger than any other form of football in terms of how many people play it on a regular basis. So I watched this game where these third graders really put on an amazing show and decided I really at some point in my life would need to see what it looked like played by great athletes rather than kids. Uh, I guess I was still in my unmedicated state, so that was one of my hundred ideas a day that sort of flittered off into Never Never Land. Three years later, I decided, uh, I'm not sure why, randomly I kind of just had this thought come back into my mind to maybe do a little research about uh, some of the data that might suggest whether or not there could be a business out of this uh, activity. And I could tell you for sure at that point I'm medicated and I couldn't really have gone through the research process, the thought process, building decks. Uh, it would have been considerably more uh, challenging, uh, you know, previously. And then how did you make it happen? Um, well, like any entrepreneur, you start out with your sweat and your own money and eventually you decide you got to use somebody else's. And 
off you go to get told no by a lot of people and occasionally find a yes. And, uh, uh, you know, I threw more pitches than Nolan Ryan. Uh, and, and fortunately, I got a few yeses along the way. And, uh, so we funded, uh, we funded an organization called the American Flag Football League. Well, not only did you fund it, but you managed to get on the NFL network. Yes, and um, uh, very exciting to be on the network. Obviously, the association with you know, the number one brand in U.S. sports, uh, the audience for uh, football in this country dwarfs the audience for any other sport. Uh, participation uh, level of flag football is actually bigger than ice hockey and lacrosse combined. Wow. Flag football is growing while many, many sports are shrinking as a result of either specialization where kids are reducing the number of sports they play or their time being taken up by electronics. Right. Uh, so somehow, without anybody minding it, flag football is extremely vibrant and prosperous uh, because of its raw kind of appeal. It's just a good game. It's a good game from the standpoint of playing sports. There are so many benefits that kids get from being on teams and playing sports. There's obviously the muscle development, but there's so much social development. Right. And, um, you know, I've been coaching our son since first grade in a bunch of sports, and it seems like kids kind of start out where um, the first thing you do is you teach them the rules, and you try to get them to obey the rules so they don't die. And then at some point, um, they start to find out that there are exceptions to the rules. Uh, that life isn't always fair. But the first thing you need to do is sort of give them the structure of, like, these are the rules and we kind of want you to obey them. So one of the great things about sports is it's a very safe environment to start learning how life isn't fair. Um, you know, how sometimes you're going to lose and you got to figure out a way to play the next game, and sometimes the ref's going to you know, make a mistake, and sometimes your coach isn't going to be a very nice guy, and sometimes you're not going to get the ball, and so on and so on and so on. It's kind of figuring out ways to overcome adversity mm-hmm. uh, in a relatively low-risk setting. Um, you know, it's an enormously valuable thing for kids to do. But one of the problems that we have, though, is so many of the games that are, are giving kids those really good uh, uh, returns on their time are also putting them at risk physically. And it seems like a, if you don't have to do that, maybe we want to find ways to get the benefits without some of those risks. So for sure, flag football, I think, is a great mixture of something that as a participant has all of the things we want out of team sports. Uh, but as a parent, maybe it's missing some of the things that you'd want to be missing uh, in team sports. But as an activity in terms of entertainment, which is really the business that we are in, um, nobody watches anything because it's safe. They watch things because they're fun. Right. And, um, you know, I actually have a, a theory that I've developed, which is, uh, uh, Doctor, which is my um, unified theory of everything. <laughs> so it kind of encompasses, uh, you know, just about everything. And the, the, my unified theory of everything is that life is about when you pay when people pay attention to something, they really want to get something back. Uh huh. Um, and that when you look actually at entertainment, news, social media, everything now that people are sort of investing their time in, they want to get paid back. I think that's why Game of Thrones is the most popular show because it talk about something that returns your investment of time. Like at any moment, something really remarkable can happen. You know, and you don't want to hear about it from somebody else. You want to right. see it when it happens. Right. Uh, and as it turns out, football really does this better than any other sport. It, it pays off your, your paying attention to it better than any other sport in that every game matters. Every game is kind of in the balance. Uh, either team can win. And, and even in those micro moments of the game, either side of the ball can win. The offense and defense are kind of balanced in a way that they aren't in most sports. You know, you have 100 points in some games, one point in others, and football has this sort of just right Goldilocks amount of stuff that happens. So football is a really, really interesting game to for the future, given how everyone is kind of um, now engineering their understanding that people want their attention paid off when they give it. So you can see all the sort of programmed addiction that's happening with video games and social media and so on. Um, but in a sort of much more wholesome way, football does the same thing. Um, what we're going to do though, is we're going to take all that and give it to you in a form where it's actually improved and it's improved, not because it's safer. It's improved because the players, because of the safety are not hidden from you. So now you see the players and you see how athletic they are and you see what their personalities are. So they play without, they play without helmets. 
Yeah, they play without helmets or pads, and um, essentially they look like basketball players. And, you know, a very large part to me of the appeal and the growth of basketball is about people's connection on an individual level to the athletes. The athletes have become characters. Uh, yeah, sure. They have personalities and personality traits and interests, and there's a story to those to those players that is known to the crowd, and that's part of what attaches that affinity between the crowd and those players. Well, now, now if someone if someone's listening and is saying, "Oh, good, I want to watch this," how do they how do they go watch a game? So uh, the NFL Network will have our games live again next summer. Um, we're going to generally be on TV in June and July each year. Um, but all of the games that we've already played are now available on uh, AFFL.com, which is our website, AFFL.com, or at our YouTube channel, the American Flag Football League. YouTube channel also has all of our, um, all of our games. And they were um, generally recorded uh, from a sky cam view, which is a great view for the ADD folks out there. That gives you a lot of stuff to think about. So the season is just June and July? Uh, yeah, generally we're going to be uh, playing in the summertime um, in that sort of zone where football's in a little bit of a lull, where there's not a lot of other content. Well, that's, a, that's a good... And how many teams? Uh, last year we had a tournament with 128 teams. This year we're going to have slightly more. Um, wow. But ultimately we'll be transitioning to um, away, away from a solely tournament-based model to... Uh, a more traditional looking league with teams based in cities. Wow, Jeff. And are you the commissioner? Uh, I haven't given myself that title yet. Eventually, <laughs> I think I'll probably wear that hat. Uh, at this point, I just call myself the CEO, but uh, uh, I think, yeah, I'll probably be the commissioner soon. Well, you, you've clearly given this a lot of deep thought. You have a whole philosophy about it and a whole uh, unified theory of everything about it. And the uh, um, it's it, everything you say holds together and makes a ton of sense. Well, we'll see. Um, I don't know. If it's, I don't know if it's related to uh, to ADD or just uh, the way my brain works generally. But I I can get very very granular when I think about solving problems. You know, either mathematical problems or situations or whatever. And um, a lot of people listen to me talk about this and they say, wow, you've given it a lot of thought, but I, I can also see their eyes are kind of spinning around. So sometimes I need to simplify this thing a little bit, but the basic idea is it's a very engaging game to watch in the media. We've got really good response. It's a very engaging game to watch in person. And what's interesting is a lot of sporting events are either really good to watch in person, but not so good on TV or vice versa. And the kind of magic is really happening when it's both. And uh, we think we have something where that's the, that's the situation. And I, I think the other take-home point from our podcast today is the, the power of making the diagnosis of ADD uh, even in your 50s. You know, the, the people think of this as just a diagnosis for children. Well, that's not true at all. And look how your life was changed uh, getting the diagnosis in your 50s. You'd been doing fine. You know, you... Cornell graduate working as a bond trader in, in Manhattan. It's not like you, people think you have to be doing poorly to benefit from the diagnosis. You, you were doing fine, but now once you get diagnosed, you do even better and find, you know, sort of find your true calling. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I was very unhappy. There was a point where our son was being evaluated. And it seemed that the... Um, that the bar that he was supposed to get over in terms of being evaluated as having it was some kind of meaningful kind of underperformance academically. Mm -hmm. And I sort of said to them, well, underperformance relative to what? Because if he's, he could be getting B pluses, but he should be getting A pluses. How do you know, you know, is it only worth, you know, it's sort of like, like me as an example, is it only worth, addressing it if it's made somebody really lag behind everybody or what about just the extent to which somebody is lagging behind their true self and it didn't seem to me like at least the way that some people were thinking about evaluating a person that there was any space for that that it wasn't really about getting to know the person and understanding the effect it was having on that person it was more about well how is this person doing compared to everybody are you doing okay so that sort of disqualified one from meeting the standards of the diagnosis i thought that was not 
really, I, I was not happy to, to see that that was the way they were looking at it. They, they were they were saying you have to fail in order to. Yeah, essentially, you know, you know, it's it, it's it, it, we're not looking at how it's impacting the impact it's having on on you. We're just saying we can't really say that anybody ha- has this condition unless it has had this effect that it's brought them to really, really, really stand out relative to everyone. And I, and I just don't know why that would be a standard. Yeah, and then it, it makes no sense. I mean, you know, the, the, the diagnosis is really a, a rests on a collection of, of ways of being in the world. And if you have, if you have those ways of being, uh, you, you can be excelling as, as you basically were. But with the diagnosis and treatment, you could be doing so much better. And, and, and that's what you experienced. And, and I hope your son is experiencing the same. Yeah, he's going to be awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for, for being with us. And thank you for what you're doing for the American Flag Football League and also what you're doing for uh, the cause of ADHD. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell. If you have a question for me or a show idea for us, email it to connect at distractionpodcast.com. Or better yet, call us and leave a voicemail. Call 844-55-CONNECT and leave us a message. We need to hear from you. We look forward to hearing from you. We want to hear from you. So 844-55-CONNECT or email at connect at distractionpodcast.com. Distraction is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcasts for curious people. Our sound engineers and editors are the wonderfully talented Pat Keogh and Chris Latham. And our producer is the multi-talented and unbelievably brilliant Sarah Curtin. 